of sound, I guess. Um, so as we're warming up here, you can probably guess uh, what our topic is today. Uh, we'll follow on and finish off with uh, uh, buoyancy as being one of our topics. And uh, some of the things that we've looked at in the past have certainly uh, revolved around that. And so maybe we can pick out a few more small examples. Do that. What else have we got? Um, and this as well. I guess so just the, the end part. Then has. bounce over the torpedo nets installed in the dam's reservoirs. The bomb would then bounce over the torpedo nets installed in the dam's reservoirs before spinning down the dam wall and exploding. The squadron began their mission from RAF Scampton on the evening. So you get the picture, I think. Um, the, uh, the movies of uh, emergency breaching, uh, I guess, or rapid rise, uh, sometimes, uh, well, is quite spectacular, of course, to see. Uh, not always without uh, consequences. Um, the, uh, on one occasion, I guess, I can't remember, the information is actually on this stuff here. The Ahime Maru, uh, uh, during exactly through one of these events, uh, this rapid breaching, unfortunately came up underneath a, a surface vessel. The surface vessel happened to be um, a teaching vessel for Japanese fishermen uh, to learn how to be, a, a, I guess, a long distance, deep, deep ocean fisherman, and uh, came up underneath it and sank it uh, and uh, went to the bottom. And so, it's tragically close to the Hawaiian Islands. Um, also related to submarines, uh, when was this? Uh, the Kursk disaster was a Russian uh, submarine uh, that was uh, lost in 2000, I guess just about in your lifetime. Um, and uh, with, uh, I think, all, all men lost. Most recently, there was uh, this incident of another small miniature Russian submarine that was lost apparently with a crew of five. Uh, all of which were very high-ranking officers, which was thought to be some kind of little spy submarine that would go around maybe tapping into transoceanic uh, communication cables to be able to do things with them and maybe pull out information. So, and finally, the, um, the bouncing bomb. Uh, whoops, I guess I didn't need, mean to get rid of that. Um, let me just pull it up again. We looked at it the other day, right? And I don't want to go through the whole thing, but the very final... Down part. the damn wall. The bomb. But if I put this on... So the skipping part's not so relevant to what we're talking about, but the fact that it sinks when it gets somewhere. Uh, the idea is that if you had it sitting on the top of the dam, all of the energy would go out into the air, which has very little uh, mass to it and therefore not very much inertia. But if it sits at the base of the dam, at the bottom of the, uh, the pool, then when it explodes, it has to react against the, uh, the water pressure that's there or the mass of water that it has to move out of the way. And moving something that's 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter versus something that's one kilogram per cubic meter is, uh, is much more difficult. And so the, um, the effect of the uh, explosive, just like putting stemming in a blast hole, you put explosive down at the bottom, I guess it finally happens. So, so just like putting stemming in a, a blast hole to, to pack, tap the explosive in so that when it explodes, it doesn't just, all the energy doesn't shoot up the, the blast hole, the same principle applies here. And so sinking is really just negative buoyancy, if you like, and so that's what we'll uh, deal with as we go through this. So hopefully the sound for these are turned off. Um, and so that kind of sets the stage for what we want to do today. Uh, if I can do this, all right. So we'll carry on from uh, where we were last time. I and mean, we don't want to do this to, to death. We'll finish pressures on structures to today. Um, and so, as usual, we'll kind of recap where we are. Of course, buoyancy is just another manifestation of um, pressures on structures. Buoyancy exists because if you take this buoyant balloon that's in the subsurface, the pressure that's acting on the top is less than the pressure that's acting on the bottom. 
And since the balloon essentially weighs nothing, the volume of fluid inside it has been removed, there's a net excess pressure acting upwards, a force acting upwards, and therefore that's the, the motive force to do it. So we'll find out today exactly how we can define that. It's quite straightforward. But maybe before that, we just kind of recap uh, what we've talked about uh, so far. I thought the best way to, to do that, potentially, was to go back to where we were actually last time. I guess I need to do this. This. I don't think you have a chance to scribble this down, but this is kind of a modified figure of the one that we had last time, just to make a, a one point. We made the point when we finished that there's lots of different ways that we can solve these problems. There's not just a single way. You remember that we had this problem of a, an L-shaped gate, a backwards L, I guess, in terms of what it looked like, that was hinged at the top and that could swing this way with the weight of water pushing down on the base and the horizontal force of water pushing on the side. Uh, and we wanted to know what the force was we had to keep it in place. That was the basic problem. And what we did was we looked at the pressure distributions on one side, the pressure distribution on the base. We didn't really mention the fact that we really have to define a control surface, which is this thin blue line that's around here that allows us to do that. And if we do that, from the forces acting horizontally and vertically, we can take moments around the, um, the uh, side, around this hinge. And if we do that, we end up with a solution to calculate P. That's how we ended up last time. The, the forces that we use, we can get by our, um, what we've talked about in terms of what our uh, standard results are. And that is that a resultant force is equal to the unit weight of fluid, the area of the surface we act acts on, and the depth of the centroid. Um, we had a kind of a figure maybe for a plate. Well, I didn't want to do that. And so in the case that we have a surface like this, um, and we have a coordinate system which we define as y. And if this is our plate, this is our recap still. If this is our plate, then what we can do is we can define a number of points. The first is that the, the depth of the centroid of that plate is h sub c, which is this, always relative to the surface. And we can also define a coordinate length, which is the horizontal distance to that centroid. But the location where that force acts, the resultant, if you like, is always some distance beyond that. And that distance is given by, I'm not doing very well, is given by this length here, which is delta yc, if you like. And so we can always get the location where this acts by, again, a standard result, which we showed last time. And it's equal to, well, if I can remember it correctly, it's um, this second moment of area about the centroid divided by the slope depth of the centroid multiplied by the area plus the depth of the, the slope depth of the centroid. So yc plus delta yc. For a planar surface, it's always correct. And so for this particular geometry, this is the centroid. This is y sub c. This is delta yc. It's vertical. And so hc and yc actually end up being the same thing, right, in this particular case. So in this particular case, this is also h sub c. And so we can get this force distribution from this. The other way we could do it is we could draw a control volume that completely contains this gate and all the fluid within it. If we do it, then the control volume here is on the outside, where it's just air. And therefore, we don't have to worry about this gray part of the pressure distribution. Um, we have a pressure acting on the top of this block, which is the force due to the water. And we have a pressure distribution on the left-hand side, which is acting horizontally. 
and the weight of the water. And certainly if we resolve this, then the pressure multiplied by the area of this plate here has to equal this force plus this weight. And it has to be exactly the same as this force here. So this, this expression has also to be the case. The other way that we could solve this would be to have the control volume that goes completely around here. And if we do that, now the weight that's acting clearly has to be the same as FV1. But the horizontal forces, the control volume is outside the gate here, so there's just air acting here. There's no, no force. It's acting all the way up to the surface, so there's this full triangular pressure distribution on it. But there's also this partial triangular pressure distribution here <coughs> acting in the opposite direction. So this here, uh, I shall use a different color. So this area here and this area here cancel out with each other. They're both oriented differently. And so this red pressure distribution, you can see, is exactly the same as this. And so again, the solution has to be exactly the same. And so it's useful to be able to, there's not just one way to solve these problems. It depends on where you actually want to draw your, your physical control volume. Okay? And so these expressions that we have here, number one and number two, are absolutely general for uh, plane surfaces. All of the things we've looked at here are straight lines, so they're planes. And I guess the third thing that we didn't say is that we have to have a, if you like, what we've called a failure mode. And so these forces we can get independent of assuming any failure mode. They're just acting on the system. If we want to be able to calculate what P is, we have to be able to define the mode in which it's going to deform. And so this third part is important because we have to actually take moments around this uh, pivot. We could, if you took moments around here, it would mean it was failing downwards. And that's not what you're being asked to do. And so those are the three requirements. For this. So, so maybe that's useful to be able to clarify that. So anyway, so this is being recorded. So if you can't write this down, at least you can uh, refer to it in the, the notes. OK? In time. All right. So. So yeah, so those are the things that we've already talked about. So what we have done so far is um, made the point that these expressions are appropriate to plane surfaces. And so now what we might want to do is look at the behavior on uh, curved surfaces. And of course, the behavior for curved surfaces, we can kind of deal in the same way as this. For instance, if this was a curved shape, we could divide it up with a pressure behind it, a pressure on top of it, and then the weight of this in the, the bulb of the curved surface. And so that's exactly what we'll attempt to do. And so we'll just go through some examples, I guess, here. And they're a little contrived in some respects because we're splitting things up and why would we want to be able to do this? But if we wanted to be able to solve this, in fact, we've already done this, right? The very first example that we talked about when we talked about pressures on surfaces was this idea of the Comet, the 1950s uh, first jet airliner that kept on dropping out of the sky because the cabin uh, would fracture because the windows were square and had stress concentrations. And we looked at dividing the cabin into two halves and looking at the pressure distribution acting up on it. And so this is a little bit like this. So if we look at this, what we can do is we can realize that um, if we wanted to be able to split this by dividing this in half vertically, then if we did that, you could imagine that on this surface here, we'd have some kind of triangular pressure distribution. Right? It's actually a plane surface now. And on this surface here, the pressure acting is going to be atmospheric, which is zero. And what we can do is we can just resolve forces to find out what the resultant force would be that's acting in this system. And so um, if we divide it into the two parts, if you first uh, divide it horizontally, or not horizontally, the horizontal force, I guess, 
is exactly this. And we can look at these forces. So this is the force applied by the water. This is the reaction, if you like, applied to, to act against that, because we know that sums of forces horizontally have to be zero. Sums of forces vertically have to be zero. And we can calculate what F1 should be. It's going to be given by this expression, which we said is a general expression. And the only thing that we have to know is what the areas are. The area, presumably, not presumably, will be this area here. Right. This, this would be the area. Uh, a one foot length of pipe. So this is one foot here, and it's three feet deep. If you look at the location of the centroid, we know how to get that as well. It's just going to be the standard result, which is going to be in the middle. So the depth of the centroid is going to be 3 over 2 feet. And the unit weight of water in English units is, imperial units is 62.4. And so that gives us the force that's acting horizontally. If we want to get the force that's acting vertically, then I guess we have two components. One would be, if I get rid of these, if we look at the ver vertical forces that are acting, then on this surface here, it's atmospheric pressure. So pressure equals zero, so we don't have to worry about that. There's the weight of water that's acting here and the reaction that has to be collinear to it. The fluid acts through the center of gravity. We know from our standard results that we have here that we talked about last time that the centroid of these different structures, this is the centroid of a plate, a balance point, with you know, of the plate, balance point of a circle also in the center, balance point of a triangle. I guess you know that if you take this is going to be a third, this is basically a third of the height if you measure it two thirds, I guess. So if you take a triangle, the balance point is always a third away from the base. Uh, and two-thirds away from the tip, going out from each side. And so if I would, wanted to, to balance it, that would be the point over which it would sit. It looks a bit more complicated here. But you know, if you take a triangle that looks like this, it's not quite straight, right? but it has a height h perpendicular to this line here. Then the balance point is a third of the way along here. the same as this calculation here, just looks a bit different. For a circle, uh, it's 4 times the radius over 3 pi. And for a subdivision of that circle, if we just cut it here, clearly it's going to be on the same axis somewhere. And it has to be this distance, 4r four, four over 3 pi, in from this corner and in from this corner. So that's, this is the balance point. If I took this quadrant, quarter circle, and put it on my finger, at that center of uh, the centroid, it would physically balance on my finger if it was um, a uniform thickness plate. Okay, so we need to know where it acts, and so we know exactly where it acts, which is this um, location in, in the centroid. And the weight of it we can get just from the unit weight multiplied by the area, or the volume, I guess. This would be. Um, the volume, which is equal to the area times one foot. I guess this should have one foot on it. The length into the page. Because dimensionally it's not consistent, right? R squared times unit weight, which is newtons over meters cubed, would give you something, a weight per length. So you have to multiply it by length to get rid of that. So that's been added in here and you end up with the magnitude of the vertical force. Um, so we have a system now which has a vertical force, um, which if we want, uh, uh, acts downwards. We have F1, which acts horizontally. And we know that the resultant of these has to be FR which is just going to be F1 squared 
plus w squared, which is a force. Square root, this is just Pythagoras, which is what you have down here. And we could also take moments around this point if we wanted to see exactly where it acts. And it turns out that because all of these pressures that are acting on here are perpendicular to um, this location here, it has to act through this particular point. They all point through there. I think there's a picture here of a, paint, a tainter gate, yeah, a tainter gate uh, as an example. A tainter gate is a gate that you lower to keep water behind it. And the idea is that the gate is curved so that on a, a circle, and so the arc is a circle so that every single force that acts acts through the hinge here. And so the construction of this gate can actually be very light because all the forces are acting through this central pivot point. And so it turns out to be the same condition here, that the, um, the resultant acts through O, and it will act at this angle here, which is given by this diagram, which you can calculate just from trigonometry. Okay. So it'll act through this point here, and you could do that also by taking moments around any point in the structure you want to be able to, to show that. Yes? Um, why do they use one foot for the, the, the vertical forces weight, uh, for length? Why do they use one foot? Because of this. So one foot length of the grate into the page. Okay. So yeah, so it was missing here, but it's, it is here. So it's just the forces per foot of the structure. Um, for the curved surface, we've kind of covered this in some respects. You know, when we, we talked about these other ways of looking at things, uh, this really is just another way of doing this, right? We took, instead of looking at the pressures, we could look at um, a, a force applied on the structure by this supernatant fluid that we have sitting there, and we just add this force onto the weight that is present. And so this solution here is doing exactly the same thing. What happens if the structure is a curved surface, but it's below... A depth of water which is HA, we can do exactly the same thing. And so um, in this particular case, we would look at the forces acting vertically. I suppose here one way to do that would be to just do this. This force would be this ver oh. Didn't, didn't change color? Am I doing the wrong one? This force acting down here is what is on this diagram is F1. And you could do it two ways. You could calculate the fluid pressure at this point here and multiply by this top area. That would give you a force. Or you could calculate the volume of fluid which is present within this uh, box here. So F1 is equal to this volume multiplied by the unit weight. And it's also equal to uh, the unit weight of water times the area times H sub C. And H sub C here is this length. H sub C is HA. And of course, this product here is exactly the same as this volume. Right? This volume here is HA multiplied by whatever this length is here times the length into the page. And so they, they start becoming equivalent to each other. Right? They have to be. They physically have to be. And so you'll work your own ways of finding how to do this most conveniently, but there's an equivalency. And I think this is really a, an important figure to, to have in your mind that there are multiple ways to do this, and whatever is most straightforward to you, you should use. And it's just a matter of being able to divide your problem up into a, a form that you can solve straightforwardly. So if you have these, we can uh, equate horizontal forces. The horizontal force in this case would be this, which would be F2, which would be just this resultant. We know that F2 
is equal to the unit weight times the area on which it acts times the depth of the centroid. We know that the depth of the centroid uh, is going to be what? Hc plus radius over 2, whatever that radius is. Right? It'll be halfway down this, this length here. And so we know what this is. We know that the area is going to be the radius multiplied by length into page, for want of a better word, whatever that is. And we know the unit weight of fluid. And so we can certainly get the horizontal force. The vertical force will be the sum of two forces. One, we've already figured out what uh, F1 is. Um, the weight is going to be uh, the volume times the unit weight of the fluid. And the volume is going to be pi r squared divided by 4, because it's a quadrant, multiplied by the length into the page. This is the volume times unit weight. And so you can see that. And so the, again, we can do the same as before. And that is, we can get the magnitudes of these reaction forces. So the horizontal force is going to be equal to F2. The vertical force is going to be equal to the sum of these two components here, each of which we can define. One is by the weight of fluid in this quadrant. One is by the, not the mass, but the weight of fluid. In f they have, we have to add apples to apples. So all of these units are in force, units of force, Newtons, SI. And the force acting at point one, we can get two different ways. Take the pressure acting at this point and multiply by the area, which is exactly what this is. This is the area. Uh, no, sorry, no, sorry. This is the pressure here, these two terms. The pressure acting on this is the unit weight multiplied by the depth of this area below the surface. We know that, the height of fluid above us. And then that pressure <coughs> multiplied by the area gives us a force. Uh, we can also get it just by the volume of that component multiplied by unit weight. It has to be the same. Um, and we can also get it by using this expression here, which was this one, right? This is, so we did it in three different ways. The weight of fluid above us, first one. The standard equation we use, unit weight, area, and depth of the centroid, which was this. But we also notice, note that this standard equation is the same as saying uh, that it's equal to the pressure acting at this point, which is uniform over this area, multiplied by the area. So that's exactly what this expression is. So I hope I'm not confusing people by just trying to be too uh, analytical and clever about this, but there are different ways to, to, be, to be able to do that. Won't go through any more examples. Um, oh, yeah, actually one, one example. Maybe quickly. So we want to talk about buoyancy as well. Um, quick example. Uh, how would we solve this problem here? I don't know why we have this thing here, but anyway. So here's a, an interesting, I think it's an interesting example because it makes us think a little bit about what's going on. Um, what do we know about this? The question is, what is the force that's exerted by this um, roller? that's pushing up against uh, a key side. And so what we have to do is be able to figure out exactly what the forces are that might be acting on this. So what we could do, one easy way to do this, would be to isolate a control volume around here, which I guess is this. Which you kind of see below and figure out what the pressures that are, that are acting uh, on this. And so what do we know? We might think that this is kind of atmospheric, but it can't be, right? We know that if we go from um, one, we know that the pressure distribution in this must look something like this.
And so we know that if we go to this particular location here, the pressure must be something like this magnitude here. We also know that if we go from this point to this point, from dt dx equals zero, right? If we go horizontally in the fluid, to irrespective of the path, and end up at the same horizontal elevation, the pressure here has to be exactly the same as this pressure here. And so, because of this expression. And so that's the one thing to realize here, that if we draw the free body diagram that represents this, I'll go back to red again, it's going to look like this. It's going to be this on this side. It's going to be, actually let me draw it like this. I'll draw it like this. It's going to be this on this side, but this doesn't exist. Forget this, right? Because it's just air. So the distribution has to be this trapezoid that we have here. And so the free body diagram looks exactly like what we have down here. And I guess I could draw it on there just as easily, right? F1 is going to be due to this. F, oops, sorry. F2 is going to be due to this. It happens to act on this vertical surface, so we don't care about this. This only has weight acting downwards, but nothing else, as indeed does this have weight acting downwards. We're only going to resolve horizontally, as the question asks. And so we can calculate F1. So F1 is going to be equal to what? It's going to be equal to, if this is the area of the plate, not drawing that very well, maybe. You can see that I'm trying to draw a perspective diagram of this. So this is going to be HC. So F1 is gamma HCA. And I don't know, this red outline, which I didn't do very well. Sorry. This is the area that we're talking about that's here. I didn't draw it very well. This is the green area of this. So F1 is just that. And the area on the other side, F2, will be equal to HC gamma area. The area will look something like this, right? If I draw it back from it. And the only thing you have to realize is, of course, that the centroid is at this point here, and the depth of the centroid, h sub c, is relative to this overall water surface, right? Not due to this point here. So this is going to be hc that we do here because it's on this plane that we have this kind of trapezoidal distribution of pressure. It doesn't go to zero at this point, but it's trapezoidal. So HC would be halfway down here, and it'd be this. So if we know the value of this force F2, which is this, if we know the value of this force F1, then if we just sum them to equal zero, then we end up being able to calculate the force we have to apply. So, tricky little question, but if you rationalize this part, the only tricky part, I guess, is to realize that this isn't atmospheric pressure, and this distribution shouldn't be a linear distribution. Okay. Right? So, all right, so let's say uh, goodbye to that. This is actually a useful thing. This piece here is the same as the, our opening statements that we had that we looked at, which is this. Just to make the case that you can solve these problems in a variety of different ways, either by getting the forces or by taking the weights of the fluid that are present, and they're all equivalent to each other. And so this is just uh, solving a problem where you have a gate with water piled up behind it, calculating the reaction on this by three different ways. By the area of the plate with the centroid, by a trap triangular distribution of pressure behind it, 
or by dividing it up to a weight of water with pressures on the upstream, pressures underneath it, and the forces on the gate. Probably more involved than it needs to be, but it makes the same point as that first point, that first slide. So I'm not going to go through it, but it's just it's important to realize that there's more than one way to, to solve these problems. What else? Oh, okay. Well, this is maybe I, I don't like this explanation. I'm going to do it differently. I'm going to do it on here. So let's talk about buoyancy. Buoyancy is really just an extension of what we've just talked about um, for the behaviors of um, these gates and the pressures that are acting on them. And you presume, um, almost certainly, you've heard of Archimedes' principle before uh, and how it works. But the idea is really just this. We know that when we look at fluid pressures uh, below surface, we know that these fluid pressures are equal to unit weight times the depth. We have to be a bit careful that when we use our expressions, not for this, we use H instead of Z, but we know that we can define the behavior in terms of this vertical coordinate system. We know that if we had a container sitting in a fluid, that we would have a pressure that is acting on the top and a pressure which is acting on the bottom. So this would be P1, say, and this is P2. And that we know that we can define each of these pressures merely by referencing ourselves to this graph here. This is Z1 and this is Z2. And so what we could do is we can look at a um, res resolving this force diagram that um, a net force may be applied to this, which we'll call the buoyant force. And this buoyant force will be equal to P2A minus P1A, which is the same as a P2 minus P1. And we know that P2, for instance, is equal to the unit weight of fluid times V2. Forget about our sign convention for now. And so if we write that out, we have area, unit weight, Z2 minus Z1. Z2 minus Z1 is just this. So this is equal to H. So the buoyant force is just equal to the unit weight times the area times the height. And of course, this term here is just the volume. That's a standard result. Absolutely true. It doesn't have to be a nice cylinder that we're dealing with. It can be an irregular shape, but this is always true. This is the unit weight of the fluid, the fluid that's displaced. Um, this is the volume that is displaced. And it provides a buoyant force, which if we have a cork that's underwater, it makes it want to pop up. If we have steel, which is underwater, it makes it want to go down. The buoyant force is negative in steel, and we can just resolve forces to that. So it's entirely uh, true for all places. Um, I suppose we might want to make the case that if we look at this volume and we, instead of uh, taking it as a, a cork or a bucket that's underwater, we do it as a, a regular shape, then the point where this force acts is always at the cent center of mass, the centroid of this volume. And so the center of this volume is going to be 
obtained by just doing this. And so it would be at the center of the volume. I guess it's acting upwards in our particular case. So FB acts at center of displaced fluid, which is the same as the center of the volume of this structure. Right? And so if we need to take moments around things to do something, then that's what we need to, to know. Okay. So that's uh, buoyancy. And so um, that's actually pretty much all we need to know. So actually, really, it's not very different from these problems with gates where we have this curved surface at the bottom and a height of fluid above us. This has some weight acting to it. This just happens to be a volume that's had the weight removed out of it. And therefore, it wants to pop out of the system. But we're still resolving forces. If this um, bucket wasn't weightless, it would have some weight that we'd have to resolve also. Um, if it's full of air, of course, then it's not weightless because there's air in the system. And we might have to account for that air that's present in the system. Uh, but because it's a trivial amount, we typically don't worry about it. Uh, but if it's a balloon, for instance, then the whole essence of a balloon in air with hotter air inside, you know, so we, maybe we talked about this when we first had this, started this class. There's a buoyant force of a balloon, and it's because there's a, dis, a, a mismatch between the density in the balloon and the density in the air, right? So if, in other words, since it's a given volume, if the density of the balloon is less than the density of the air outside, then by definition, um, so in other words, so, so FB in this particular case would be equal to the volume of the balloon multiplied by the density of air minus the density of the air in the balloon multiplied by G, right? Because this is this here is unit weight, not dividing it by it, but this is unit weight. Differences in unit weights. And so the only way we can do that is if you remember the ideal gas law, pressure is equal to density RT, which we can rearrange as density being equal to pressure over RT. And so we can only make this density less um, than the air outside in three ways. We could make the pressure larger, uh, so it's compressed. But we then can't contain that. Um, sorry, make the pressure smaller, rather. So it's less dense. But the balloon will collapse because we can't make it strong enough to resist that. So in other words, we can either make the pressure smaller so that the density is smaller. Or we can increase the temperature, hot air balloon. Or we can change the gas so it's a lighter gas. Helium or hydrogen versus nitrogen, oxygen, which we're living in right now. So that's the, the reasons for buoyancy. Let's just do a quick example um, from the notes, which I think there is one. Well, maybe this is worthwhile. So we've done this analysis to get the magnitude of this force. Um, and I guess, yeah. Did I call it the center of buoyancy? I don't know if I did. But the force acts through the center of buoyancy, which is the center of the displaced the centroid of the displaced volume. So for this plate, it would be right through the middle, Pennsylvania State College. Uh, if it was a volume in the other direction, it would be the same thing. For a sphere, it would be through the center of the sphere, uh, etc. So if we want to do an example, here's a very simple example of a, a buoy. I call them buoys. You might call I think in American they call them buoys. Um, I don't know why. Um, this is really the physical circumstance of the pressures acting around the surface, but it's actually much easier for us to think about it. I don't think you need to think about it that way. It's easier to think of it like this, I think. In which case, we don't need to do this, but philosophically, if we wanted to think about it, and we resolved it, instead of thinking about pressures like this, we could think of exactly this, 
And all we'd have to do in our evaluation is I guess we'd have to add these extra weights that exist here. So W1, W2, etc. Except we don't need to do that. We've got an expression that defines exactly what's going on. So the buoy has some buoyancy. It's tethered to the bottom of the seabed by a cable. We can draw a free body diagram. The free body diagram has a force that's acting upwards due to the buoyant force, which is equal to the unit weight of the fluid outside, the liquid in this case, multiplied by the displaced volume. The cable has a tension in it, which is T, and the buoy uh, has some potential weight to it, which is W. So these are the forces that are acting here. And we can just resolve that FB has to equal the sum of these other two forces. We know that this vertical force is equal to the volume displaced multiplied by the unit weight of seawater. Uh, if we know the weight of the buoy, do we? Yes. This is the weight of the, the buoy, the buoy. And uh, we, we know that. And so we know this. We know this. The only thing we don't know is this. And we can calculate exactly what that is. Nothing more than that. Buoyancy always acts vertically upwards. The same as weight always acts vertically downwards due to gravity. So in the z direction, what we've called the z direction, I suppose. And it explains some things uh, like stability. And so the center of gravity of something is the force through which the weight of this acts. So the center of gravity for this happens to be the centroid because it's uniform. And so the center of buoyancy and the center of gravity for this would be exactly the same location. If this was a heavier structure that was bottom heavy, then the center of gravity of this would be below the centroid, right? Because now all of a sudden I've got a weight on here that would mean that I'd, the balance point would be closer to that weight. So the center of gravity for this would be lower than this, but the center of pressure would still be the centroid just of this, this volume. And that would be very stable, because this is where buoyancy acts, pushing upwards, and gravity acts below it, pulling downwards. And so it always, if, if I tilt it so that they're off, off from each other, like in this diagram here, I guess. <laughs> so if the center of gravity is below, then if I move the center of gravity to the side, by tilting it over, it'll always pull itself down. Center of gravity wants to go down, buoyancy wants to go up, and the moment is net um, counterclockwise in this particular case. If, as you know, you put a lot of people on the deck of a boat, uh, you have a lot of weight sitting on the top, you have the opposite case. You have the center of gravity, which would be the balance point of this thing around my finger, relative to the center of buoyancy, which if it's the same volume, would just be the centroid of this plate, you have it in the opposite situation. So the center of gravity is above you, center of buoyancy is below. If you give it a small uh, perturbation to the side, then all of a sudden this weight is acting downwards, this is acting upwards, and the net couple is to turn it upside down, to capsize it. And so that's pretty straightforward when you're talking about submerged bodies, because a submerged body never changes its volume displaced uh, because it doesn't interact, pierce the free surface. If you have a boat which does pierce the free surface, all of a sudden it gets more complicated because now the displaced volume is changing as a function of rolling the ship. Right? This is the displaced volume in this particular case. And so the center of gravity of the weight of the ship is always going to be stuck in the same place but the center of buoyancy can change as you move it around. And so this is uh, the case where you, when you do this calculation, you can now calculate the, uh, in this case, this would tend to restore itself, right? Because the center of buoyancy here is pushing up, and this is pushing down, and that would tend to rotate it so that now this buoyant force would act directly underneath this as it ro rotates back to this position. And of course, that's the reason why uh, in systems like this, 
we put a heavy weight in the bottom so that we make sure that the center of gravity um, is, uh, in, well, this is, I guess this is a self-writing system. In this case, the, the buoyant force always, no, this is, this. so this, if the center of gravity here is here, this is always tending to, to instability, make it unstable. Two seconds, because we've had questions like this on exams before. Um, what happens if you put a weight inside that's pulling down on a, on, uh, on a stopper? Basic question is, uh, how much pressure do you have to supply to be able to get this, to pull this weight off? Pretty straightforward, if you just had a weight there that has this same uh, magnitude all the time. But what happens if you have air pressure acting in here? Will it change the buoyant force? If you're doing a free body diagram, the pressure acting on this is one of the forces. The buoyant force of this block in water is one of the forces. And the weight of this is uh, pulling down. This buoyant force does not change with the air pressure, right? And you can show that because if you look at the pressure distribution that you might have in this system, Then if the initial pressure is equal to atmospheric at the surface, right, at this point here, then the pressure acting on the top and the pressure acting on the bottom are offset by some amount, which is what gives us the buoyant force. But if you increase this pressure acting on the top due to air, then all you do is you shift this point over here and you shift this point over here, and clearly the buoyant force doesn't change. And so you can calculate what kind of pressure you have to have before it kicks off this thing. But the buoyant force will always be the same, and the weight acting will always be the same. Weight doesn't change, you know, but the buoyant force wouldn't change either, given that you change the pressure that's acting on the surface. So it doesn't matter if you have atmospheric pressure acting on the surface, or you have absolute zero acting on the surface, which would vaporize the water. Right on time.